There we go. So welcome, welcome, folks. Um, if you were here for a couple of minutes, you've uh, heard um, I'm Michael Barber and my colleague here, Randy Labonte. Uh, Randy is up in Half Moon Bay out on Victoria, or Vancouver Island, sorry. And is it Vancouver Island? No, no, and actually- I was say, that's where you used to be on, out on Vancouver used, Island. used to be on Vancouver Island, but no, it's, it's north of Vancouver. Uh, and it's a, another a half the amount of time on a ferry. Um, it's actually in the land uh, of the Shishalf uh, band and uh, nation. And uh, I'm on Zilkwe, which is the way that the originally Half Moon Bay was pronounced as. Okay, perfect. There we go. And um, so I'm gonna say, and I'm Mike Barber. I'm down in um, Vallejo, California, at Toro University, California, uh, which is on the uh, traditional land of the Karkin people, which were one of the eight Ohlone tribes down here in the Bay Area. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the annual State of the Nation uh, study. Um, given the fact that there's only like six participants here, eight, including Randy and I, uh, we're going to be very informal. So I'll just go through um, putting up a couple of slides. But once I get into the, I guess, the meat of it, um, feel free to stop us and chat and stuff, because um, you all came here with specific questions or curiosities. So I'd much rather get to them than I would get to the slides. Um, so if we don't get through all the slides, that's fine. But um, and Randy's going to watch the chat, but given that we're a small group, by all means, just uh, interject yourself into the conversation because we welcome that. Um, so if you're not familiar with the report, we've been doing it now for a, a long time. Um, I suspect this year's cover, I think we're going to go with yellow because uh, we debated going with yellow last year and then went with that orangish color. Um, so it'll look very much like the last, I guess, 10 that we, or nine that we've had, uh, except for it'll be yellow in color, and it'll be the 14th one that we've done. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention all the sponsors that actually make this report possible. Um, essentially, it's a funded report, so these folks um, provide funding for us to be able to do it and then come out and present it. Um, and they do get some, uh, we have them as an advisory board to help us with uh, getting some input and some context. If you've never been to the website before, uh, this is the most recent version of everything. So we update this pretty much in real time as we get information, whereas the printed reports that those covers come from uh, basically get done once a year, trying to figure out what happened as of the end of the last school year, although that's been a variable in the last couple of years as the pandemic has slowed things down. Uh, but so this is always the best spot to go. Um, and it also allows you to sort of go specifically and dive into what's happening in your jurisdiction or the jurisdiction you're interested in, in much greater detail. Um, so over the past 14 years, this is roughly how we've gotten the data. And for the most part, it is, um, Basically, we, we use the ministries and things we're able to find publicly, uh, particularly documents that we're able to find publicly, popular media items. And then we also have an ongoing individual program survey where the roughly 260 programs across the country get uh, emails from me. Uh, this year it was actually only four times, usually it's six to eight times throughout the fall, asking them to complete their uh, survey from the previous year. Uh, we also as you might imagine, both part of the Canadian e-learning network, as well as the fact we've been doing this for 14 years. We've developed relationships with a lot of key folks uh, who are actually on the ground implementing a lot of this. Uh, so we rely upon those key stakeholders uh, to really verify a lot of the information. Um, normally, this is all done in like July through November-ish, so we can actually get the report out before the end of the calendar year because the 2021 report would have normally say come out in December of 2021, reporting on the 2020-2021 school year. Um, as it stands, and, and this was true of last year as well, uh, with COVID and the numbers being down um, and the increased demands being put up on educators, um, including those that are sitting in the ministry and a lot of the, the leaders that form our key stakeholders group, uh, things have been delayed to the point the this year's report actually is still being written and we're still waiting to hear back from a couple of jurisdictions, as you'll see. Um, 
So to give you some sense, unlike most US states, where either there is legislation around, or at least pre-pandemic anyway, there was legislation around um, full-time online learning, or there was basically just trying to make supplemental online learning fit into the square peg uh, that is classroom-based learning. Um, in Canada, in most cases, there isn't much written about it. So while there's a lot there that has legislation by it, with the exception of Nova Scotia and BC, um, in most cases, the legislation just reads, the Minister of Education shall have the responsibility for uh, approving or overseeing distance learning. And that's usually the extent of the legislation. Uh, so if you removed sort of that column, you can see that most provinces like the US really don't have much in the way of things governing how online learning works. Um, the two exceptions I mentioned were Nova Scotia and British Columbia. Uh, Nova Scotia, it's actually built into the collective agreement that the government has with the teachers union, which has to be passed by the, the House. Um, so that's uh, where that legislation comes from. And in the case of BC, they actually have a section of the Educate or Schools Act, as well as a section of the Independent Schools Act that deal with distributed learning. Although I think they're in the latest update have call, started calling it online learning now, if I uh, noticed on the language on the ministry's website has changed a bit. Um, in terms of what's happening across the, the country, or at least the types of programs, um, as you can see, there's a, a great deal of variation. Um, the ones in red are places where there's usually a single province-wide or territory-wide uh, online program. Um, the ones in green are ones where they're using programs from other places. And you'll see the red stripes in Northwest Territories and the Yukon, because while they have their own program, they also use programs from the South. Um, and the blue are ones that are primarily district-based programs. So there's not a lot that's happening on the province-wide front, although most of those district-based programs have the ability to enroll a student from anywhere in the province. And then there are some jurisdictions that have a little bit of everything happening. Um, and that's been pretty consistent for a while. Um, it will change in the next school year. So for 21-22, so when we do the 15th annual report, um, Alberta will actually turn blue and uh, PEI will turn into one of those red striped ones like the territories. Uh, they're finally, actually, I shouldn't say finally, they used to have an online program and they're about to have a, a new one starting actually this past September. As well, the main province-wide program in Ontario, the Alberta, or Alberta, sorry, uh, the Alberta Distance Learning Center ceased to exist as of the end of the last school year. Uh, so while they do have a pr province-wide francophone program, um, all of the rest are district-based ones that can enroll students anywhere. Um, in terms of the actual numbers, these will give you the, the sense as to um, how many students and what proportion of K-12 students are actually involved in distance learning across the country. Um, and we use distance learning very broadly uh, in this. The ones in red are the ones that we don't have data for yet. Those are the ones we're still working on. Uh, the one in blue, we've got most of the data. We're just waiting on one question. Um, so you can see that uh, most, well, there's a, an average of about, actually, I'm not even sure if that average is still accurate. Um, let me double check here. Um, but yes, it is. Sorry, I did that this morning. An average of about six and a half percent of all students in Canada are enrolled in one or more courses at some point in their careers. Uh, you can see that places like Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC, uh, I guess for that matter, the Yukon as well now, are above that with Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC being well above it. Uh, you've got a group there that are close to it. Uh, when you look at say Yukon and Manitoba and Ontario, and then a bunch that are well behind. Um, so you have a, a nice range of folks that are, you know, not doing a lot, folks that are about at the national average, and then you've got some that are really sort of um, blowing it out of the water, if you will. Um, in terms of how that's changed over time, you can see here that uh, each year not only has the uh, number grown for the most part, uh, but the percentages have grown. Um, some of the, the data that you see there, uh, I'll be honest with you, the, some of the changes are reflective of just our data collection getting more accurate. And that's not just us as researchers. 
Uh, one of the fascinating things about doing a study like this and having done it now for 14 years is the fact that because we go to the ministries of education every single year asking these questions, they've actually started doing a better job of collecting the data around it. Um, you know, the number of times where we would go to them, especially in the first five to eight years, asking about their numbers and they not really having any clue what they were waiting for us to basically extrapolate it out from the uh, individual program surveys we were doing so we could tell them what their numbers are to now uh, with the exception of of quebec um, every single jurisdiction can give us a number although the the number we tend to get from ontario uh, tends to be uh, about a year and a half old uh, so as an example, the figure that they gave us for the 2020 report actually was for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, so even though we were asking in the fall of 2020, they could only give us data from 18 months before that. Um, we're kind of hoping that they're going to get better at tracking that, especially considering that they've just passed a mandate that all students in the province have to take two online courses in order to graduate from high school. And we certainly hope that their graduation isn't held up by 18 months in order to just verify the fact that students are taking online learning. Um, you can also see here the changing uh, numbers um, over time by province, so not just by, you know, nationally. Uh, so you can see that in some cases, some jurisdictions have stayed really close whereas others have kind of grown in leaps and bounds. And, you know, if you look at Saskatchewan as a good example there, um, if we were to continue this out into the past, you would see between six and 8,000 for uh, the number of students in Saskatchewan for a period of about six years. Uh, but then last year, they were two years ago, they went up to 12 and a half thousand. And then this year it's 22 and a half thousand. Um, you can see the similar growth that you see in Alberta, whereas year over year, you're getting about 10,000 more students involved in, in online learning each of those particular years. Um, even the number of students that you go to federal schools, so these would be uh, schools that were in, in, or that are indigenous in nature. Uh, you know, you can see uh, jumps of, you know, four to five, 600, um, so that over that four year period, you see a 2000 person jump. And you really notice it when you start looking at the percentages. Um, you know, so again, looking at Alberta going from 8.8 .8 up to uh, a country high of 13.3 right now. Saskatchewan going from 4.2 to 12.2 over that four year period. Even New Brunswick, if you look 3.4 to 4.8, and you know, they're not doing a lot there. So that, you know, numbers a, a big jump. Um, even the federal one, 1.1 1 .1 up to almost 3%. Didn't I just have this one second ago? Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to, if there's a larger crowd, I would have had a whole different spiel about it. And that would have actually, uh, I would have talked about how um, the you can see the, the growth being something different. Um, but anyway, uh, so when it comes to, to blended learning, we do ask folks about blended learning. Um, the data, we used to actually report a number for this, and in all honesty, the, the numbers were kind of meaningless, um, because usually they were based on one of those three things, and um, it, it, it really was difficult. So you, you, to use an example from my home province of Newfoundland, there's only 63,000 students in Newfoundland in total. Um, right now, there are some... 13,000 student accounts in the provincial LMS. That would account for every single high school student. I can guarantee that every single high school student is not using the provincial LMS because um, we've seen news story after news story in the past year um, as the pandemic has been proceeding about the complaints about the lack of online content that's been provided. Um, you know, so the fact that students get like a teacher goes in and says, I'd like my students enrolled in this course doesn't necessarily mean their teacher actually uses the content that's in there. Um, so our blended numbers, learning numbers um, can be quite, um, uh, well, they're just meaningless to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so that's really 
the quick and dirty of it and no one interrupted me along the way which was kind of hoping you would because i was hoping something might have jumped out at there that um that i that you found of interest or um that you wanted to talk a little bit more about i will put that slide up there as well and i'll drop the uh, slide share link into the chat in a second um, once i stop um, but i noticed there's a couple of things that have been going on in the chat so oh, i'll just stop me. here now and see if there's anything there that folks have a dropout rate uh, for what in programs <clears throat> in high school uh, um, generally speaking or just in, in terms of online programs how many don't finish if they sign up for a course is that the question Well, the overall dropout rate across the country is okay. actually quite consistent with what you see in, in the US. So if you, um, if I remember correctly, the last time I looked at the figure, it was something like 83% of graduate yeah. from high school. Um, I think in Canada, the last time I looked at it nationally, it was 86%. Um, and because most of the pro most online learning in Canada is done by public school districts the, and most of it uh, actually I would say the vast majority of it uh, is supplemental in nature. If a kid drops out of the online class, chances are they take some other class back in their high school. So it's not like they're dropping out of the system. And when so they, they wouldn't they count be, for that, then essentially the online programs, uh, their dropout rate is, or lack of completion, is really not different from what it is in school. So the, the programs have been around for quite a while and do a great job in terms of tracking students and then ma managing them back into a classroom situation if they do. Um, so so um, generally, hopefully, uh, Rio, that's what answers your question. Jim's question was uh, details about the programs so the LMS um, providers uh, kind of vary a little bit depending on the provincial jurisdiction. In British Columbia, where I reside, they've just uh, selected D2L's Brightspace platform. The D2L is a Canadian company out of Kitchener in Ontario. Ontario also has a provincial license for using that as the LMS, but in Western provinces as well, a lot of Moodle is used uh, with a variety of different ways that hosting solutions are provided for Moodle uh, and some of the individual districts as well will be uh, working with with Blackboard Learn. I think Saskatchewan has a provincial access and license for uh, Blackboard um, there. I know New uh, Newfoundland Labrador is on Moodle, um, so is Nova Scotia, so it, it kind of varies in, uh, around. Uh, content <clears throat> uh, again is in sort of uh, varies to a certain extent. A lot of the provinces actually create their own courses, um, second teachers over the summer to build courses, or it's done through consortium model uh, as it is in Western provinces. So uh, that's done where the school districts or school boards kind of band together and share uh, and, and you know pool some resources to get the, the courses built specific to their own LMS platform that they're working with. So it's not an equal piece. And the curriculum is different in each of the provinces. So it becomes very problematic to try to build a one size fits all course for uh, for programs. So content development has been a, a big a big issue. There are some that do license some Pearson. Uh, there's um, as well. There's uh, oh, e-dynamic learning it's courses are are done. Study Forge and and Richard and his crew have been in DLAC as well. Uh, provide some, some content as well as another group content connections that have developed things locally as well for that. So there are providers that, that are paid, but there's also uh, course materials and content that is created by the educators themselves through public monies. Did I miss anything, Michael? Not really, no. I mean, I, I, my, I would have started by saying it's actually very similar to what you'd see in the U.S. Um, in terms of who the players are. Uh, for me, the biggest difference is, and because D2L is a Canadian company, uh, you see they operate a lot more in Canada, or at least have a bigger share of the market, I think, than what they do in the U.S. Um, Moodle has a much bigger uh, position in Canada than what you find in the U.S. 
Um, in terms of providers, um, you mentioned specifically Pearson and, and K-12 Inc. or Stride. Um, for the most part, they aren't in the um, they aren't in the Canadian environment, largely in part because uh, the only jurisdiction in Canada that has uh, charter schools is Alberta, and they don't have any cyber charters or online charters. In fact, the idea of contracting a private corporation to um, operate a school is something quite foreign to Canadians, um, to the fact that, uh, well, like I do many times, they would basically say it's like, you know, handing your school over to Walmart or McDonald's and saying, you know, go, go forth and educate um, and getting the result that you would expect from that. Yeah, and I, I was typing, but I'll say it as well. Schoology is used in Quebec and a few other places, uh, although not largely uh, as well. Canvas was making a pretty good run, actually also in BC, um, in terms of increasing, but they dropped out of the provincial uh, request for proposals. Uh, and so they've tended to now abandon uh, BC and Western Canada. I'm not sure whether they'll make a push anywhere else. Yeah, one of we're a small market. Relative. I think that is. Sorry, go ahead, Randy. <laughs> yeah, we're just a, we're a small market in Canada. It's like you know, uh, there's states that are have got larger and better marketplaces. So, and a lot of the folks that I mentioned that have started doing course and course content development in Canada uh, find that the only place that they can survive corporately as a company is they have to go sell in the U.S. Yes, mastering a competency base is part of this uh, that you're, you're seeing in terms of curriculum changes. And, and actually, uh, there's a strong push around now with the, the sort of the increase of blended learning for, to more independent learning and independent and driven through mastery competency programs. Although uh, not formally in policy per se, is more it's um, shifting of practices to being more independent. And I'd add that one of the one of the, the unique aspects of Canada compared to the US is the fact that um, unlike the US where you have a dozen, in some cases, hundreds of discrete standards that need to be covered in a curriculum in most places, the um, what our teachers would call standards are more in line with competencies. In many cases, there's only a couple of dozen that need to be covered in the span of a course. Um, they tend to be much broader and much more conceptual in nature. So it allows for the, the development of mastery and competency-based learning. Um, it, it facilitates it a lot more because you don't have to test, you know, these discrete knowledge standards um, that you see in the US. I think that's all the questions okay. that I see yeah. in the chat. I mean, folks can grab the mic too if they want. I have one question. I couldn't find the chat. I'm sorry. I don't know that's why. Okay. But, um, so, so yeah, I work at an online charter school, and so it's still a publicly funded school in the U.S. Um, so some of the Canadian schools that, and I like, I, I am Canadian, so I was there a long time ago and taught in schools there. So if there is a school that's 100% online, would those mostly be private? because like public schools are like more traditional, like what we call brick and mortar. It depends on the jurisdiction, um, but in the US right now, there's probably, if you look at the total number of students that were learning online prior to the pandemic. So if we were to go back to say February of 2020, um, there would probably be about 800,000 that would have been in full-time online environments that we know of in the U.S. and probably about two to two and a half million that would have been learning in a supplemental environment. Um, so basically, you know, almost a one out of three, you know, one out of, one out of three and a half ratio. Um, whereas in Canada, the, the ratio of supplemental to full-time um, would be closer to, I'm going to guess one out of 10, maybe one out of 12. Um, just the numbers aren't, aren't there. Um, now some jurisdictions, uh, BC, Alberta, um, a little bit in Ontario is where you're going to find most of your full-time students. 
um, in Ontario or sorry, in Alberta and BC, it's going to be a good mix of both public and private. Although I would say private probably have a higher proportion of um, full time students and, and Randy's in BC. So you can verify that for me. Sorry, I was my mind was elsewhere. <laughs> I was saying that in BC, I think when you look at the full time students, a higher proportion of them would come from the independent or private schools. Uh, I wouldn't say that necessarily. There's BC's got a very interesting mix where there's a lot of public schools that offer full programs full time for students that have evolved. They're, they're much more sort of boutique in the sense that they're serving a specific clientele group. Um, and they span because BC allows for cross border approaches uh, still, although that's changed now with the legislation. Uh, but what's happened is there's a lot of uh, shift of, you know, while it was <laughs> very, very um, uh, Anderson was the, the author of this and he called it the iTunes model. So they had a central sign up for any course you want from any program offering anywhere in the province. So it was uh, an interesting um, policy approach, I guess, um, but it didn't, it, it has lasted to a certain extent, um, but they're, trying to rein it in, I think, a little bit in BC. But it, whereas in Alberta, you had ADLC that has rolled up, and but it had a provincial scope uh, as well and provincial content creation, uh, which had its own unique characteristics. But in the middle of, as other programs were growing in size, they closed the, that, the provincial program down. Totally unrelated to COVID, more around political and other you know, policy decisions that were being made in the province leading into the pandemic time. And interestingly, all of, I won't say all, but the vast majority of the full-time students that you have in Ontario uh, would be in the private schools. Yes, um, because and it's interestingly, very supplemental in the public. Yeah, interestingly, of those full-time students, you'd be surprised at how many of them actually aren't in Canada. Um, one of the, the um, unique characteristics of both the way in which the private school legislation is written, as well as the way in which these programs have tended to market themselves. Um, you have a high proportion of, of international students that have, you know, have no connection to Canada whatsoever, but want to have a, a high school diploma from a Canadian province, um, largely for post-secondary admission. Yeah. And so they are paying um, you know, these, these online private schools um, in primarily Ontario is the only place that really allows this to occur. Um, and it makes up a significant proportion of their, their full-time student enrollment. Um, Jim had another one in the, the chat there about uh, Google Classroom and Workspace. Um, we tend to see Google used much more frequently for folks that are doing blended learning. And we've also seen it a lot with the remote learning uh, folks, but largely in part because that's what they were using as part of their classroom based Classic, instruction yeah. anyway. Um, the online programs have tended to go with a more formalized LMS with potentially integrating Google as a part of that. Yeah, it's it's supplemental to but because the online programs are regulated and get audited, they have to have an accountability structure to produce good data sets and they find the LMS and and salary products and uh, you know that they add in in terms of uh, accounting for registrations and completions and you name it all of the the details that need to be happening and the LMS does a lot of that as we know um, for teachers rather than when Google Classroom or even Microsoft Teams are used it's a little bit haphazard to try to track what level of activity is going on and teachers notoriously <laughs> well. <laughs> teacher still. Um, I don't like doing paperwork, man. I want to teach kids. Uh, no, Canvas, did, I mentioned before, did try to make a push um, and has um, not had a good experience uh, in provincial uh, RFPs, uh, both in Ontario uh, and in BC, for certain that I was involved in discussions with uh, some of the folks in infrastructure as, as well about those request for proposals that went out so yeah and one of the i guess again another one of sort of the more unique aspects of canada is that 
a lot of the LMS decisions, and this varies from province to province, but um, oftentimes you'll see a Ministry of Education that will buy into a specific LMS for the entire province. Whereas you don't see that in the state where everyone in the state is using the same LMS. Um, you know, so when, um, you know, when, when the government of Newfoundland goes with D2L, they go for, to it for all of their K-12 system, all of their college system, all of their university system, and it all falls under the exact same license. Um, so they've got this end to end from the time that, you know, you hit school until the time that you're finished, regardless of what type of school you finish with, you're in the same LMS that entire time. Um, you know, Ontario doesn't matter what board you're in, um, they have, you know, province wide license. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the, the province wide license is offered, but at the same time, I know that there's many schools that still use Moodle, even though they have a provincial learning management system and they choose not to use it um, because they prefer uh, others. And independent schools <clears throat> are. Um, get uh, basically you know partial funding they're not fully funded um, by the the public dollars so it typically anywhere from half dollars 50 percent dollars etc so there are some uh, requirements for parents to actually um, also sign up and pay money so it's a kind of a mix for that but if they are getting the provincial certificate of graduation then there's provincial money that's involved Are there are there any limits within the province like to like caps as far as how many kids can go to online school? No, nope, not a single province has a, a, a cap or limit. In fact, the only province that makes any reference to numbers um, would be Ontario and that's the the two that they require now for graduation as of November of this past year. But they're counting the remote learning as being one of the courses for the students. Yeah, everyone gets a free one for the past year, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got about three minutes left, I believe. If anyone else has any questions, Jim, did you want to? This is this is fascinating. Good. Thank you both. This has been very very interesting. So, I'm going to ask another question about the market. Um, any similar players to <clears throat> Edmentum, Edgenuity, Imagine Learning, if you know those, Renaissance. Um, you mentioned something about uh, eDynamics and StudyForge. Are, are those similar or? Yeah, and, yeah. and they, they both they both have come out. eDynamic actually uh, came out of, and it's got pretty good uh, tread in, in the US as well, but it did come out of Calgary. And StudyForge has come out of uh, Kelowna in British Columbia as well. And Content Connector is another one that's come out of the, off the island. So the, the, there's, there's a little bit more entrepreneurship, a little bit more collaborative kind of uh, approaches, less structured uh, centrally in the Western provinces. We're, we're still a bit of the wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah, because what's often happened with the content is that like, if you take Ontario, which would be the, the largest jurisdiction, um about i guess it's almost 15 years ago now they went and looked around the province and saw that there was you know about 20 districts that had created their own online programs so they basically seconded you know one math person one social studies person one science person that kind of thing stole everybody's content <laughs> and this person was basically contracted to make master courses and then they provided that content back to the districts free of charge so you know so more so, of an OER model i was going to ask that yeah basically yeah and and you've got that like the fort atlantic canadian provinces have the same kind of model uh the same thing exists uh, largely in, in manitoba as well um so there are certain jurisdictions where because you've got this centralized repository um that is not perfect and most of the programs will say yeah we need to you know revise some of this and adapt it and that kind of stuff but there's not a need to go out and spend the the kind of money on it uh the other thing is the way funding is done in most provinces um like i always use the example when i was a high school teacher in newfoundland um my school basically got uh, we had 650 students when i we're gonna showed have up to there. wrap up we got some new people coming into the room yeah there were 650 people when i showed up there we had a school budget of twelve thousand. 
because the only thing we had to buy was consumables. Everything for the building, teachers, all that kind of stuff was all paid for centrally by the ministry. So, you know, $12,000 is not going to get you a lot. Thanks again, Michael and Randy. All right. And I will Michael, turn it Michael. over to the next group.